Welcome back to the Simplifiers podcast, where we take topics either in business or in life and simplify them. Now, my guest today is going to help uncover and unlock a very big topic that I dare say affects each and every one of us. I'd like to introduce to you Mary Flor Toniato. She is the author of Money, Manifestation, and Miracles. As the CEO and founder of Power with Soul, she specializes in helping ambitious y- women entrepreneurs professionals and leaders to reach financial prosperity and success while fulfilling their social promise in the world. Her work has been featured internationally in media outlets like Yahoo Finance, Washington Post, the International Business Times, Los Angeles Times, and so many more. I'd like to welcome to the Simplifiers podcast, Mary Flor Toniatu. Hello, Mary Flor. How are you? Hello, Mary. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be with you and your listeners and all the people that we're reaching together through this conversation. Oh, my goodness, Mary Flor. You have no idea. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion you do have an idea of how (laughs) awkward and hard sometimes it is to talk about money. Now, my topic that I want to really have your help in simplifying is how do we overcome our love-hate relationship with money? Can you break this down for us, please? Oh, well, first of all, I love that, you know, you talk about love-hate relationship with money because I actually put that in the book. I mean, people will come up to me and say, because when I have, whenever I ask, well, what is your relationship like with money? And love-hate relationship is always such a funny thing because on the one hand, you don't want to be thinking too much about money. And at the same time, you end up doing that because in our world, we use money, money as the currency for exchange. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it really brings up a lot of fears and doubts and, um, And the other thing that is so funny, and I say this in the book, Mary, is that if you were ever like talking about money is still pretty taboo in social situations. Yep. So if you were ever to go to be invited to a dinner or a party and you start going around asking your host and people there, hey, how much do you make? How much did you make last year? I'm pretty sure you're not going to get invited back. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and trying to break that down, why is that? Why do we have love-hate relationship with money? Now, it's interesting because women and men alike have a relationship with money. We all do. And there are when I've found though with working with hundreds of women, there seems to be a little bit more pitfalls for women hmm. in that in that money is so closely tied to our emotions and and we don't see money in isolation yeah we we see it as a part of a web of connections of relationships and of meaning so when you're making a decision especially something really big or even just going shopping for example i mean women will tend to start thinking, oh, I'm going to get this for my friend. I'm going to get this for my son or my daughter or my husband or wife, my partner, because we always want to show our nurturing and our caring and our love. Hmm. And and that gets connected to money as well. And then, you know, you get overexcited about these kinds of things. And then it, it projects onto uh, money something that could be really um, not even – money is just a tool, right? Yeah. Except we make it so much more than it actually is. And for women, that's historical. That's how some of the cultural messages that we've gotten, how we are in – like the families that we've grown up, like I could tell you stories, so many stories of how women end up under earning Mm. because of things that they had learned in their families growing up about women and money that weren't empowering. Well, can you tell us a little bit about your story? I mean, you've certainly gone a whole long way. And so take us back to your childhood and then, you know, some of your, your triumphs and mishaps along the way. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, So for me, money in my family was, uh, we did talk about money and mostly, you know, there were arguments about money and uh, it was more fear-based really, you know, these conversation, right? Because 
uh, when things were going really well, I'd never even heard about it, you know, mm. and if something was, oh, we need this or we need that, it became more of a conversation. Uh, but my parents were really, were really good in that uh, respect because they both had a finance background. Were, I mean, I, did you, did you, um, were you raised in the U.S. or somewhere else? In Canada. Oh, you were in Canada. Uh, uh-huh. In Toronto, where I'm, I'm based now. Yeah. And uh, my mom, actually, I mean, I, I just feel so lucky because my mother had a Bachelor of Commerce degree in 1958. Wow. That is so, super impressive. I, I, I mean, I love that. You know, when I was growing up, I used to think, why are all the moms going to school? And what are you doing there not making my lunch, you know? And I mean, that was just probably in grade one or something. But over the years, I really thought, amazing. This Mm. is wonderful for me because it ended up being such an incredible role model. And so for me, though, in my 20s, I found myself leaving a very challenging marriage. And I had a four-month-old beautiful baby girl And then I found myself a single mother. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I have to build us a life, and I have to be a good role model for this uh, beautiful soul that I'm now responsible for. And you got to pay the bills. Oh, my God, yes. And so we were living from paycheck to paycheck. And I would be scared, Mary. Like some nights I'd think, I really hope that rent check clears, Yeah, you know, because it was just like, I'm not getting paid until two days later, but if they cash it in, what if it doesn't go in? And so all of that kind of anxiety. And then I thought to myself, there is no way that I could go on living like this because I'm going to end up either being sick or really um, closing my, my, putting myself in a box and thinking, you know, all these thoughts that I'm a failure. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's quite a few people listening to the podcast right now going, yep, yep. I felt that. I've certainly been there. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, one of the key things, um, Mary, was two things happened for me. Very, very simple. Hmm. One thing is I, one day I just got really, really bad. And I remember one night thinking that, I am making a conscious choice at this very moment Mm -hmm. that I'm going to be successful. I didn't know how. I didn't know where that was going to happen. And I had no evidence for it in that specific moment in time. Yeah. And in it, you know, and do not and ever underestimate the fact that we have the power to choose at any time. And it's free. Okay, you don't need money for it. It's free. Mm -hmm. And so that was one thing that I chose. I chose at that moment, I'm going to be successful. Like, I don't like this story. I'm going to change this story. Yeah. And the second thing is that I made a promise to myself that if I was ever in a position to help women become empowered, especially through money, I would do it. And again, You know, I'm like 23, 24 years old. Don't know how I'm going to do it. I have no clue what's going to happen, right? And and over the years, at that point, I started to reinvent my life, Mm. really reinvent it. Like, and, and, um, you know, I was buying all these self-help books and I started to really figure out, I've got to have a better relationship with money. Mm -hmm. And. You know, I don't I don't even know where that really came from, Mary, because it's not like we're taught in school. Like you don't go to high school, for instance, um, and somebody's going to ask you, oh, let's talk about your relationship with money. Right. (laughs) You can take an accounting course, but nobody's going to teach you this. Right. And so it's so important. And then over the years, I took one step after the other. I I um, went back to grad school. I finished that, I, you know, got better jobs, and I, and I built an amazing career and became very wealthy and successful. And then I decided, you know what, I really want to help women entrepreneurs, and I want to open up my coaching business. Mm. And um, this had nobody thought, why would you do that? You have the corner office overlooking the water. What is your problem? (laughs) You know, but I just I really had this restlessness that I thought I'm I'm meant to be doing something more. Mm -hmm. And then I started working with women, like generally, you know, life coaching, just very general. And then sooner or later, the topics turned to money. Mm-hmm. And it was either a source of um, 
anxiety or fear or something that was kind of like, eh, love, hate, right? Mm. And then so I thought, okay, there's something here. And I started to work with them. I started to create programs. And then more came. Like even young girls, 15, 17 years old, wanted to say, what is this all about? I want to know about that because I need this. And so I started to do more of that. And then I remembered all those years ago, that promise that I made in the dark, thinking if I could help women become empowered with money, I would do it. And so I wrote the book. Yeah. This is why the book is here. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to dive into a lot of the principles of the book um, here in a little bit. But I I really want to put a pin in the map and just highlight something that you said that was very poignant in that. Um, It it takes getting to, I think, it takes getting to that breaking point, that point where you say in your life, enough. You know, this is enough. The path that I'm going is no longer good for me you know, and you have to make that conscious choice. And, you know, I think a lot of times people, you know, that are listening, you you have no clue how to fix it, but it just takes that moment where you step out in faith and go enough, I'm going to make a change. And it's, it's almost as if you say it out into the universe or God or whatever you believe in and they go, aha, she's, she said something. Okay. Now we're going to start opening some doors for her. Do you think that? Oh my God, you are absolutely right about that, Mary. That is exactly what happens yeah. is because the universe always meets you wherever you are. Yes. Right? So the moment that you make that choice, that conscious choice, and it's not, and you know, it's not, it's the choice. And then you set an intention and that intention becomes a conviction. Mm-hmm. See, a conviction is different because a conviction means it's your entire being. Yes. That is moving forward. And that's when the universe gets really, really uh, gets behind you in whatever way. And it, it sounds really weird, but just look at all those times and all of a sudden, a person shows up that can help you. A resource shows up. Um, Sacks of cash literally fall down into my life sometimes. And I'm not exaggerating. Yeah, like, it's like, that's wonderful. well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And, and, you know, at this point in my life, like I'm able to actually, if I think I, I love an apple today, I promise you it will show up some point in the day, even if it's apple juice. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's happened to me, right? Because you become so aligned and so connected. Yeah. And, and the other thing, Mary, that I think that talking about, you know, where, when you're really at the breaking point and you're, you know, right at the bottom, mm-hmm. there's really no other way to go than up. It's right. There really, there's no, no other way to go. And that I think we talk so much about success all the time and we never talk enough about failure. Mm, yeah. So tell me more about what you, what you think we should be talking about when it comes to failure. Well, I think that we talking about failure is that looking at that as a, not as the point where you're going to stay, mm-hmm. but actually as a point where you've got this um, there's something happens in the human spirit when you're at that bottom and you just say, you know what, I'm going to go for it Mm -hmm. because everything is stripped away. Everything is stripped away. You got nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to lose. And, and, and it's so interesting because I, you know, that I would say to myself, so what, so what if somebody says no to me, what's the big deal? Mm -hmm. And I think we spend so much time trying to think, oh, I wonder what somebody's going to think of me if I do this or trying to give ourselves permission. And sometimes we don't even act until it's really, really bad. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that happens too. But I'm here just to say, listen, I've had so many failures in my life and uh, that turned out to be gifts because they actually put me on a completely different path and it was even better than I ever imagined that it could be. Yeah, I mean, it's about looking at failure as not, oh my God, this is the end, Uh, I'm so doomed. But failure is just a learning point. It is literally a learning point on your journey that you go, oh, okay, well, so that happened. Uh, What can I learn from it? Like, how can I do it better next time? Whatever, maybe. And that translates both personally and professionally. I mean, you know, relationships, family, work, business deals, you name it. It, Failure. Uh, Exactly. 
is just yeah. a learning point. Now, you, you might have heard of this um, in the entrepreneurial world, the whole story of Sarah Blakely and Spanx, mm-hmm. right? Where she was always saying that it, at, her, at the dinner table, her father would ask her and her brother, what did you fail at today? Yes, I love it. And, and that's so beautiful because nobody does that. Mm-hmm. And it just sets the motion up to say, hey, failing is part of life. And that's okay. I'm just going to go try something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that is actually a beautiful conditioning, really beautiful conditioning. Yeah. So you speak that money is truly a universal language for women. Now, how do we truly empower women when it comes to money? Because you talk a lot about empowering women to become difference makers. Can you tell me more about what you mean by that? Yes. So... The, the, one of the things that I love about women is that if we can use wh- how we are with money, if we can use that to our advantage, it's going to be an amazing thing in the world. Because what I have seen, and I witnessed this in my own life, that when women are empowered with money, they become difference makers. Yeah. Because they're not only going to change their lives for the better, but they're going to do that with their families, with their communities at large, and if they have a really big platform, they're going to do it with the world. Yeah. And on average, women reinvest 90 cents of every dollar that they make back to health, to family, to nutrition, and to education. And research has shown that. And that's even the case, even in developing nations. And so I was just, when I was writing this book and I was doing all this research, I was so so excited about the fact that imagine more women difference makers in the world and whatever relationship we've had with money, we've gotten past that and we can get on with claiming our wealth and being a force for good in the world. Yeah. Because I mean, now is completely the best time. I mean, we couldn't have scripted this any better, Mary. Like there's this whole global uprising that's happening for women, right? Girl, I feel it. Yeah. And and this book, it's so amazing because this book was ready last year, but it came out this year. And I never knew the reason why it did. And it didn't matter because I figured there's a bigger reason. And boy, oh boy, was there a bigger reason, right? So this is, it's brilliant time right now. Yeah. And uh, just imagine for a second, if every woman on the planet could shift their relationship with money to be something that is empowering or positive, um, my, I, I mean, I really, I see it, you know, like it can change politics. It can change the environment. It can change yeah. so many things in the world, um, locally in your own neighborhood, but globally as, as, a, as a community. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. It is huge. Yeah. And I, I think that when women, uh, because of the fact that the way, as I was saying earlier, we don't see money in isolation. So we use money as a way to, to share to show our love, yeah. to show our appreciation and nurturing, right? Mm-hmm. And so if women were in a position to have more of this uh, uh, income coming to them um, and money, and it's it's that whole notion, I think what gets women excited is that the more you make, the more you can transform your life and the lives of others for the better. Yeah, I think that concept for women is so much more enjoyable than the transactional aspects of money you right. know just getting from point a to point b right. that's not that's not as enticing for women because we have a different uh, response to it we have a different uh, idea about money and so, how it should be so let's break it down then you say that money is an emotional currency what are the four driving forces behind that and how do we overcome them So money is an emotional currency because it's strongly tied to our sense of Mm self-worth, our self-confidence, our feelings of sensing that, do we deserve this? Mm. And feelings of safety and security, which is huge for women. Now, you will see that we don't even have to go very far and we will know of some woman who is in a relationship in a career, in a job that is no longer serving her, Mm. no longer serving her, but there is a security element attached to it. And the fear is so big 
to go beyond it, mm. right? And so this is what's huge for women. And, um, and the emotions that are, there's four emotions that really um, come to the surface that I've found is the most uh, relevant yeah. uh, for the emotional currency. And that is fear yep. is number one. Um, the, you'll, you'll find this interesting, but in the United States, there was a women, money and power study done. And they found, this was in 2013, they found that in households where women are, are, uh, have household incomes over $200,000, these women secretly feared that one day they will become bag ladies. It's crazy. So, I, was just, I had to include that in the book because that's I couldn't crazy. even believe that, you know? Yeah. And, and so that's that whole fear about having it and losing it yeah. or not having enough. Right. That's a big one. Depending on where you grew up, that is a big one. Mm. The other one is guilt. Women take on a lot of guilt if, if they have something and others don't have it. They're almost like, oh, but I want to help. You know, sometimes money can even become so, um, they'll even lend money to people that they know and give it to people they know that it's not going to even help them yeah. or it's going to put them back. Right. Mm. So that's happened many a times. Um, and I've heard so many women say, oh, my gosh, I feel so guilty when I spend for myself. Mm. You know, I mean, I've heard that, too. The other one is shame. Now, shame is also universal in that, you know, Brene Brown talks about the fact that it's like a shame is like really gets to the core of the fear of maybe not being loved. Yeah. or lovable. Yeah. So that shame, you know, so if, if you weren't that great with money to begin with, like in your belief system about yourself and something goes wrong and you lose a bit of money or, or whatever it is, that kind of shame that a woman will carry, she will carry it really to the core of her emotions and her identity. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth thing is fear. I mean, is sorry, not fear is uh, anger. Mm -hmm. That's the fourth thing. So anger, you know, anger is really interesting because anger could be ang anger at somebody that has something to do with money for you. So it could have been like, for instance, I've had clients who were angry for the longest time with their parents because their parents couldn't send them to, to college or to university and they had to work for themselves or, you know, my partner lost it all or I lost it all. So some sort of anger towards money. And this actually keeps away abundance and wealth from you. 100%. It's like, it's like this film. Okay. Because we don't see it, but there's this energetic push that's happening that I don't want the money and, or I don't deserve the money or I just really hate money. Mm -hmm. Right. And that anger really can keep you away from so much opportunities. And, um, and when I'm working with women entrepreneurs, for example, I, I just had a conversation with somebody today who was really angry at the fact that um, she invested in somebody else's company and, oh, I really felt like I had to do it. Mm. And, uh, now she's got this whole anger thing and her business is at a standstill mm -hmm. in terms of income. She's, she can't break that ceiling of that income level. And so when I started to talk about her with her about, you know, forgiveness and specific exercises around that, she actually thought, oh my goodness, I've never even thought that that was even possible because I, I say to, to, to women is that your anger about money is likely what's keeping you from your prosperity and wealth. Yeah. Well, and you're spending so much either conscious or unconscious yeah. emotional energy on whatever that feeling is or that grudge yeah. or that, oh, yeah. why doesn't he understand whatever, you know, that you're, I think yeah. it just, you get exhausted, right? And then that's where if your brain's getting exhausted, your brain can't 
actually see opportunity all around you. And so if you can't see opportunity around you, guess what? There isn't going to be opportunity that comes to you. So you, you have to let it go, right? You have to like appreciate what your blocks are. Have a coach like yourself to say, hey, do you see this? Hold the mirror up and help facilitate yeah. you to get through it because it's not serving you. Oh no, it's not. And it's so amazing. We all, we all carry blind spots. Mm. You know, we all do. I mean, and this is why, you know, coaches and all of the people that in the personal development space, that's why there's so many of us is because we ourselves yeah. have coaches because we all have. We're human. I mean, yeah, we're human. Everybody's got a blind spot. And it's so much, e- isn't it so much easier, even when you're having conversations with, with your girlfriends, it's so much easier to spot it for somebody else, yeah. but not yourself. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. where you need a trusted mentor, coach, best girlfriend, or accountability group, or something that helps you just, yeah. you know, level set and check in. And it's not about pointing a finger and shame because that's a whole other cycle that goes back but it's just being loving and saying hey there's this thing you know and it's not serving you so yeah exactly I want to talk about I know in your book you speak of a holistic wealth wheel what is that yes so a holistic wealth wheel is one of the things that I get my clients to do to assess their financial starting point Mm -hmm. So a financial starting point is like with any goal in life, if you want to get to point B, you got to know where you're starting from. You have to know what point A looks like so that you can plan ahead and say, well, I'm going to need this, this and this to get there. Right. And so a holistic wealth wheel is looking at wealth and abundance in all areas of your life. Everything in our life is interconnected. And when we're talking about prosperity and abundance and money that like that is of course money it fits in one area of your life but if you look at all the areas in your life like your relationships your health and your your uh, well-being your relationships uh, with significant others your environment like your office or your home your career Mm -hmm. finances all of that if you look at all of that and start to assess how how prosperous and abundant am I in those areas? And you look at that and you start connecting the dots. You're actually going to see that you are more abundant than you think from Mm. a starting point. And I do that with clients because I want people to really get a sense of the, a realistic snapshot that it's not all gloom and doom. It right. really isn't. Even when you think it's gloom and doom, let's say you know, oh, I don't, I'm, I'm not doing so great in the finances department. But boy, oh boy, do I have a loving family and supportive environment, and I just love how everything. I mean, that in of itself is going to help you get through the phases that you need to get through to, to you know, increase your wealth. Right, and that, I mean, that's a wealth of a different currency, right? Like when you have yeah. wealth of love and connection or, you know, community, yeah. that that is something to, you know, appreciate and, and gratitude goes a long way. So it sounds yeah. like with the um, wealth wheel, it's a matter of figuring out your starting point, right? It's like, yeah. like assess where you are right in wherever you are. And everybody's path is different, right? One person's, yeah. Uh, you know, hundred thousand dollars a year is not the same as one person's twenty thousand dollars a year of, yeah. of what they make in in a year, and you know that that it doesn't matter. That's the, that's not important, right? It's about yeah. your journey and going forward. So let's break it down. Then, how do I simply and practically heal? any of my money issues. Um, and, you know, again, like you say, you say earlier, like really truly become a difference maker in other people's lives. What are the first few steps after we take an assessment? Yes. Yeah, so the first few step is that, um, first of all, we talked about the, the having the choice mm. right away to say, I am going to be successful. I'm going to be wealthy, whatever that is. I'm going to be abundant. And so that's number one. Number two, so that helps you set an intention. Number two is you've got to turn inward. And it is an inner journey. Yeah. Uh, We see, uh, what we see in our reality on the external of all the successes, it's just a mirror of what's happening on the inside. And so 
Um, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a solo journey. It definitely, though, is an inner journey. You cannot escape that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and we cannot look to somebody else for how we feel, right? Yeah. yeah. So the other thing is the the uh, giving yourself permission. This is huge for women. I mean, I cannot even, I, I can't, you know, um, I don't know how many times I use that word whenever I'm coaching. What are you willing to give yourself permission to have? And it's, you know, sometimes there's like silences because they've never thought that they can have mm-hmm. what they have, right? And I, I love this quote from Oprah that I've never forgotten. And I think it's going to serve anybody listening to us. And that, that quote is, you will get in life what you have the courage to ask for. Amen, sister. Drop the mic like, yeah. Oprah, yeah. Oprah knows the stuff. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I completely understand that. And so anybody listening to that, that is exactly true. That's exactly how things happen in life. Yeah. So then you, you've gone inward. You're going inward. You're going to, um, I would very much hope, Please get the book and nourishingly apply what's in there because it's a step-by-step guide. Yeah. It's actually a, a course or a program on its own. Yeah. So so the other thing is, so you go in and then you identify what exactly of those four emotions, fear, guilt, shame, and anger, which one is the most prevalent for you? Mm-hmm. And then if it's, let's say it's fear, which is very common. Then, then ask yourself, where did this come from? Where did this come from? Uh, whose fear is this? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, I cannot tell you, like this one woman who told me that, you know, um, her father's fear was that um, if she didn't get married to somebody who's going to support her, she was going, you know, she was going to have a bad life. Mm-hmm. And she spent years under earning. And she she took on her father's fear. Mm. And the reason why she took on her father's fear, she loved her father, she respected her father, so she thought that was a good thing. And even though all logic didn't make sense, that was her actual emotion and belief. Right. And, you know, those core beliefs you you start to graft into your brain at an early age, you, you don't realize how much they affect your trajectory and, your, and you have the choice to change those. Your beliefs can change if you choose that, you know, it, it, yeah. they're, they're not permanent. They're not written in Sharpie marker. You know, there's an eraser. Yeah. Go ahead and rewrite it. No, no, you're right, Mary. Like, and, and here it is. This is actually a very simplified way to start to build your muscle because it's yeah. like building a muscle yeah. to changing your beliefs. Yeah. So you isolate a belief that you have as uh, maybe something like I can only have, I can only make great money if I work really, really hard for it. Mm. Okay. Oh man, I had that belief for a long time and it almost knocked me out into burnout. Right. And, um, and so you look at that belief and you think, A belief is only something that helps us to make sense of our world because we're going to look for evidence outside of ourselves now to validate that that's true, right? So I was looking for evidence. Oh, look, so-and-so stays late uh, at work all the time and, you know, he's going to get a promotion, right? That kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, And then so you choose what is the next belief that you would like to have that sets your emotion free? Right. Because once you change a belief, your emotion that corresponds that follows right after. Yeah. So, for instance, um, I said to myself, well, I would love to say that I can make great money with grace and ease. I would love that belief. And then I checked in with my intuition and emotion and the emotion was like a relief. Right. Mm. It was a relief. And um, then I started to think, okay, if I'm going to take on that new belief, what current belief do I have that I want to release? That you have to release, yeah. But yes. And that you, ha- okay, so here's the thing. You have to release it, but the, the wanting to release it are two different things. That's interesting. Go tell me more. Well, because when we have to, it's a part of like a should mm. that, that everybody kind of goes, oh, somebody's Ugh. telling me to do it, yes. right? But the want to, the desire is your own. It's mm. your own inner motivation. Mm. And 
that's the difference. You know, it's so interesting. Yeah. Again, subtlety of language of, of how we speak to ourselves, you know, that makes a huge yeah. difference in what we accept, right? Exactly. Oh, my goodness. And so there in those steps that we just talked about, somebody listening to us can now say, I want this new belief. Mm hmm. Right. And yeah. that's how you do it. And you're going to have a tennis match in your head because it's going to be like, yeah, but you've never seen evidence for that. How's that going to happen? You know, all these things, all these things. Stinking right? Stinking little... thinking is what I call yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> and monkey mind and all of that. Yep. And how that happens is what if you were to play a game with yourself? Right. What if you were to play a game and say, I'm going to look for evidence now to say that somebody can actually make great money with grace and ease. I'm going to look for that evidence, which I, I did for myself, actually, because I said, this can't be the only reality, right, yeah. that I was having. Yeah. So and then you start to look for it. And you're going to start to find clues that people are actually doing that. Brilliant. You know, so that that's something that somebody could break down right now, very simply. I love it. And you know, that definitely can apply to money, but that can apply to your beliefs about your health, your weight, your relationships, your ability to attract a mate. I mean, you can apply this exact simple principle you just talked about in so many areas of your life. So if you're sitting there listening to this podcast going, oh, I don't know if I believe that, like, what if? Just like give yourself that permission of, well, what if this is true? And test it and see. I think people yeah. will be quite surprised, right? Oh, I think so. And 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 the truth is that we love to imagine possibilities. Yeah. Right? That's that's one of the most beautiful things about um, our capacity to be creative. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I tell you, I've seen people open up uh, side businesses and things that have taken them in different levels, you know, just because they chose a different belief. Yeah, it's so important, you guys. So, you know, your book goes into so many more principles um, and you really take a holistic approach to shifting your money mindset. What's one more principle that you think they need to um take away in this episode and then of course read the book to get all of the all all eight principles i'm going to talk about the other one is about improving your money habits and actions all right tell us because more I, I think this one's really they're all important but one of the things is that you can start doing this right now is it's around integrity that mm. it happens on two levels it's integrity with yourself and it's integrity with your actions yeah and so when I'm talking, and this can, again, be much broader than just money, but we're talking about money in this capacity. If you have ever, we teach people how to treat us, okay? So if you have ever, let's say you've got, you want to be a trustworthy person and a person of integrity. If you now remember, oh my goodness, I owe somebody money, or I, you know, I forgot to pay something on time, or whatever that is you've got the opportunity to remedy that right now because you're also teaching the universe of how money comes to you, mm. right? And um, so think of that. Is there anybody, like I am so, so um, really just aware of the fact that, you know, sometimes um, we'll say, somebody will say, oh, it's okay, I've got this or whatever. And then, um, you know, we'll all chip in because we've gone for dinner or somewhere and then somebody else pays a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I'm so conscious of the fact that I always circle back with that person and say, did I pay enough? Is there, you know, because that shows integrity with money that you can be trusted to have money and large sums of it. Yeah. Okay. So that's one. I love it. And the other one is your actions with money. Like, how, how do you treat money? For instance, um, this is going to sound weird, Mary, but we're going to go there. Okay, look at your wallet. Look at your wallet. This is where you hold your abundance. Mm -hmm. Look at it. Is it messy? Like, what does it say about you? Do you like what it says about you? Um, does it look? Does it look like I'm a successful entrepreneur? I'm a successful woman in business. 
And I'm not saying you've got to get the most expensive wallet or whatever, but it has to make you feel abundant. Yes. And not just like hold together by a duct tape and bursting at the <laughs> seams with receipts and things crammed in it and all of that. I mean, you know, I, I'm a big believer in simplifying. So, you know, every yeah. now and again, you just got to clear that wallet <laughs> and make it yeah. clean yeah. and easy. And yeah, I love that. Yeah. And more will come to you because whenever you declutter, nature... You created space, right? Mm -hmm. And nature abhors a vacuum. So something's going to fill that space and let it be abundance. Do you let know? It, let it fill. Do you know something funny that I uh, started to do as a practice for myself? And I, I like to think of money sometimes as a game uh, that you play. Yeah. You know, just give it some playful uh, uh, energy to it. Is that yeah. I like to? Um, I live in England, so we have the pound coin. I like to put pound coins in random pockets of my jackets all over my house. And so I've got you know jackets in the closet, and you know winter jackets, and all sorts of jackets. And if I just put some pound coins in there, it's almost like giving future Mary a little love note of like, oh, I just found some money in my pocket. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I've got my tram fare or my bus fare or, oh, I can get a cup of coffee today or, or whatever. And it's just, you know, I can, it, it, by putting money in my pockets and, and magically randomly finding them, you know, months down the line is such a fun little thing that I do personally. I, I love that. I love that because it's, um, it, it doesn't have to be heavy. Like anything yes. that we do around money doesn't have to be heavy. So this, and, and look at like, as you were speaking, Mary, like you were just so enjoying the fact that, you know, there's abundance in your life. Yeah. And it reaffirms and, yeah. like a, a mantra that I say to myself that I say money comes to me freely and easily. Like that is something uh, I say. And, and you know, it does because, oh my God, I mean, even though it was my own money, it's magically in my pockets. And I'm like, oh yeah, brilliant. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. these little things that help, you know, take the scariness out of money and make it more fun. Yeah. Because, you know, money really isn't scary. Right. When you it doesn't um, have to be, it doesn't have to be. And there's a part in the book where I talk about the fact, what if your money was your best friend? Like, how would you treat it? Yeah. Right. Because you're I mean, these are some, you know, in some ways, some people will think, OK, these are, you know, new ways of looking at things. And that's exactly it, yeah. because it's all meant to. Um, get women past this because they are wanting to be difference makers. Yeah. So let's put it in the context that it needs to be put into. Oh, girl, I could talk to you for days and days and days. <laughs> Your book is so good. I've read a good chunk of it. I'm not all the way through it, but it is so good. And I highly, highly recommend that you guys all go check it out. The book is called Money, Manifestation, and Miracles, A Guide to Transforming Women's Relationships with Money. Now, it's out in bookstores all over. Um, and you can also check it out online at her website, which is the link is down below in the show notes, maryfloor.co, C-O. Now, in June, depending on when this episode airs, you will also get access to a virtual version of the book. So you're doing a whole eight-week online course, right? Um, and so, yes. Yeah. And, and what you had said is uh, it's an in-depth guide to the book and helping to continue the teachings through video form as well. Yeah, so the, what it is, is I realize that everybody has a different way of learning. Yeah. Some people would love to see me teach them, you know, about concepts of the book, right? And some, you know, are fine with, with reading it, right? But what if the book could come to life? What if I was in front of you and you can download it and have access to it at any time and teaching you all these principles? And I'm putting in bonus things like... Um, morning and evening rituals for abundance, how you actually um, connect to your higher wisdom um, in terms of getting the right like intuition of what to do next. Yes. And, and what does it mean with, you know, this when we talk about dark night of the soul, what does that really mean in, in terms of abundance and money? Yeah. Things like this that are not in the book because the book already had so much um, tips and tools and strategies. So this will really make the book come alive. So I'm excited to share it with everybody in the world. Brilliant. Well, there's a few questions I like to ask every guest that comes yeah. on to the podcast. Um, first and foremost, what's one book you're reading these days or blog that's either inspiring you or maybe poking at you and challenging some of your beliefs? 
Well, it's so interesting because the, I reread um, the book by Mark Allen, who is the president of New World Library and my publisher. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book called Visionary Business. And um, I really love it. And I often um, read it because of the fact that um, a lot of the uh, alignment of the message of my book is also really in alignment with uh, being a visionary business maker. Excellent. And, uh, and so I, I love that. And I, I think, you know, fantastic. And um, so I would highly recommend that to people as well. Great. Um, what's maybe one good app or tool that you're using in your life that's really helping you simplify things? A tool or an app? Um, well, this is funny, but there's an app that you know, kind of tells you when to go to bed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually use it because I'm one of these people that when I am so engaged and engrossed on, you know, because um, I just love what I do, mm -hmm. I will, you know, I, I, you could find me at three o'clock in the morning and still feel like, oh, I'm okay, you yeah. know, but that's, you know, you will get depleted pretty quickly. So I actually use the app to tell me when to go to sleep. <laughs> Are you, is that the iPhone one where you press yeah. them in the alarm? So if you're an iPhone user, um, it, th I just discovered this a few months ago too, and I love it. It's so great. So you press the button that says um, clock or alarm, and then you flip over to the tab that says bedtime, and you can actually set, okay, if I want to get eight hours of sleep every night, you just set when you need to go to sleep and when you wake up normally, and oh, it's just, it's like magic. It goes, bing, it's time to go to bed, Mary. <laughs> like, <laughs> shut it down. I know. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I know. And it's, I mean, that sounds really funny, but it's true. I mean, so when true. we are so engrossed in what we're doing, you're like, oh, just another, just another hour. And the next thing you know, it's one o'clock in the morning, right? It's true. And you've got another big day ahead. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I like. The sad inside joke between my husband and I is I go, oh, one more email, just one more email. He's like, yeah, one more email. Uh-huh. Sure. I've heard that one before, but no. Yeah. yeah. Love it. That, yeah. I highly recommend that as well. So Mary Flora, tell us um, who is one person in your circle of friends and or business network and community that you think we should interview on the Simplifiers podcast and why? Oh my gosh, I've got so many of them. But the one woman that comes to mind is Ingrid Vandervelt. And she is the CEO of Empowering a Billion Women by 2020. Ooh. And when you when you get my book, she actually wrote the foreword to it. And Ingrid is a dear friend. And um, she is her company and her mission and, and message is all about empowering a billion women um, by 2020. And that is, you know, through business, through technology, because she's also a technology entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And she has a foundation that helps women get access to technologies and tools to start businesses, even in developing nations. And so my uh, proceeds actually of the book also go to um, her foundation as well. So I mean, I'm so happy to make the introduction because she's just a brilliant, brilliant, beautiful soul. Uh, very spiritual, and uh, she was actually named um, one of Oprah's 100 um, Super Soul uh, Leaders. Brilliant. Yeah, no, she sounds perfect for the podcast. That's great. Yeah, no, she and she's, uh, she's comes to, to London every so often as well. So yeah, I'm sure she would absolutely be happy to do it. Wonderful. So uh, we are big believers that gratitude and simplicity go hand in hand. Tell us what's one thing you're really grateful for in your life right now? Well, I am so grateful that I get to uh, really bring this book out in, into the world and bring that message to, to women and be able to reach you. Like, this is how we all got connected. Yeah. And, uh, and all of the ripple effect that that's going to do because really now is our time. This is a call to action for women that if you have ever wanted more, be more, have more, and do more in your life, this is it. And now is the time. It's all possible. It's sitting it's very right possible. in front of you right now. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So Mary Floyd, thank you so, so much for being on the podcast. Before I ask you my final question, best place yeah. that we can find you online, is that Instagram? Uh, find me online on Twitter. Okay. At Mary Floyd Global. Okay, perfect. And um, 
and Instagram as well, and my full name, Mary Flor Toniato. Either one of those. Brilliant. We'll put those links again down in the show notes so everybody can click through and check that out. Um, and again, the book is now available in bookstores and online, so make sure to grab a copy of that. Money, Manifestation, and Miracles, A Guide to Transforming Women's Relationships with Money. Um, so definitely go get that book and, and have a, a listen to it as well and read. Um, all right, so somebody's been listening to our podcast today and they're inspired. They are excited about the possibility of, oh my goodness, can my money situation actually get better? And there, there's maybe something that, that really perked their ear up that you had said that um, really just sparked their attention. But they've been, they're kind of down in the dumps and their life is, is sort of hitting that breaking point. What's one thing, Mary Flora, that you could whisper into her ear right now to encourage her right there in that moment? I would really say, because women are so heart-centered, I would say money is part of your spiritual purpose. You can be rich and have it and be happy and be uh, an inspired entrepreneur and you can have it all. You really can. And it's yours for the taking. Brilliant. Mary Floor, Tony Natu, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I, what a, just an incredible gift to have this conversation with you. And thank you so much for what you are doing and this upliftment that you're providing to the world. We got to do the thing, girl. We got to do the thing. We got to do it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you.